but we've invested a lot of time to do a shoulder stability, vertical shoulder stability. You can't have posture like this. The bar will yeah. drop forward. That, within a year, reduced rib stress fractures by 40% by just altering strength and conditioning program. Not the physical therapy approach, not the volume intensity of the training adaptations, simply working at the exercises that you wouldn't necessarily think that they are rowing specific. Hey, what is up? Welcome to Last Stroke Counts. Today we have the owners of Light Blue Clinic in the house, in the Light Blue Clinic in Cambridge, both of whom also work with CEBC. Miwash and Gosha, please welcome to the show. Hello. Hi guys. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Uh, I think this probably, the, probably will be the second episode of these that we put out. Um, we kind of briefly spoke with Gosha about what you guys do, but just to kind of go into it again, what is the Light Blue Clinic? Uh, so we are in the first cryotherapy center in Cambridge. We freeze people. We take people to very extreme temperatures. So the cryo chamber, um, cools down to minus 120 Celsius. So this is, this is mainly what we, what we do, but we are also strength and conditioning coaches. Uh, Miyosh is an osteopath and I'm also a clinical health advisor. So we combine all of these services under one roof. Awesome. Uh, yeah. and then uh, your guys' involvement with, with, uh, Cambridge University Boat Club, uh, how that came about and what you've been doing for them. Yeah. So myself, I, I think I've, I've started back in 2013 or 14. I can't remember really now. Uh, but it's been over 10 years. Um, originally involved with the women's program, um, with the strength and conditioning provision. Then uh, in 2018, um, roughly where Gosha started as well, I've, we've moved to, to the men's program, um, offering also the physical therapy side of, uh, things as well. Yeah. Um, you're also doing SNC. I am, yes. So we're trying to divide our responsibilities to make this um, whole venture easier. So Miyoshi she's mainly responsible for um, osteopathic treatment and general rehabilitation, also overseeing the strength conditioning program. And I'm mainly on the ground, the person who actually delivers the program. So you set the program that breaks them and he fixes them. <laughs> pretty much. It kind of like depends on the day who's in charge of what. But yeah, pretty much. This As a setup for a private practice outside of it is the brilliant way of <laughs> <laughs> It's also great when they cry to me and then they want to go and see me or to fix them. So this is how it works. Uh, yeah. I mean, no, it's just part of it, isn't it? Trying to, yeah. trying to perform at the highest level. Um, you're always constantly treading that line of, of performance and d overdoing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I asked Gosha before, I'm interested, because again, you didn't necessarily come from a background of rowing. How did you find rowing as a sport when you came into it? What were you like, this is insane, that they, they're not yeah. doing this? Yeah, I, I, well, <laughs> I, I think um, there was definitely that. I think th this was the period where I was working with the rugby club at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we really were, weren't getting much results with the rugby lot. Um, mainly the, there was a bit of a culture issue, but eventually... Um, they made a change and, and, and results started to come. However, um, working for both clubs, I saw a, a tremendous, um, almost a proficiency, athletic proficiency in students, in rowing students. Mm -hmm. uh, I, a no drinking, um, alcohol, um, always consistent with the training, always willing to follow the advice of the coach. Um, no questions asked and grind those 20, 25 hours a week. And I really liked that because obviously I studied to work with the athletes. Um, I wanted always to work in the, with the professional athletes. I'm not saying rugby players mm -hmm. aren't, but at that point, uh, I, I think CUBC is what, um, what I really wanted to, to, uh, to work with. Um, over time, obviously, whilst I came in, the first thing I've noticed is that the strength and condition wasn't strength and condition as you learn at university. It was circuit-based exercises, mm -hmm. endurance, 
uh, 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 weightlifting, um, rather much, you know, n- not much of a strength building uh, athleticism. Yeah, I think Ray's very good at building the big muscles and very good at ignoring all the little ones. Well, but, yeah, build the lats and quads and you'll you be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the core, don't forget about the core and the trunk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, um, it's interesting with the rugby thing is, again, I, I look back, I remember, um, it was a 2015 World Cup or around that time. Uh, I've got Welsh family, so Welsh rugby is, is my sport. Sure. And I remember them talking about, they were sort of saying, oh, this team, they've really brought in, they've started doing all the cryotherapy stuff and they've not been drinking and they're not going out and they're getting their sleep in line. And I was like, yeah, they're at like the World cut like you would have expected that to be like but it was but it was being said that this was like a special thing yeah yeah, yeah. i mean the, it, it comes with the culture doesn't it uh and then it, it's not a bad thing it's it, it, it it's great if you want to make friends for life uh definitely work in the rugby club uh but, <laughs> so but uh, you know you want athletes to follow exactly everything to a letter uh, for what you recommend and to do uh i i really enjoyed and hence i'm working with with rowing athletes yeah. for the past 10 years. Awesome. So when you initially set out to work in the sport, did you have any particular aspirations or like itches that you wanted to like scratch? For example, like where you, did you always like have a passion for fixing people or you were just generally interested in being involved with the sports world? Uh, well, I think, I think I was always interested in, I think both of us, um, were always, um, uh, in sports, uh, uh, surrounded by um, athletic population, um, but for me, I think I've burned out a little bit with regards to strength and conditioning. I saw patients, athletes, um, clients that suffered with pain um, or had an injury, and I really wanted to understand the background of it, the pathophysiology, as we call it. Uh, of the injury why why is this patient suffering or an athlete suffering how long they're going to suffer is it safe to give them exercises and what type of exercises to give them uh, and i think that was the the reason why i eventually went on to study osteopathy yeah and then with the the cryotherapy obviously that's presumably a really not a, not a cheap piece of an equipment so like a big decision to move no, in that, <laughs> in that direction what was what made you feel like that was something that you wanted to go down that path i mean let's be honest it was me or she's idea i bought into it completely i must say are you blaming um, him <laughs> i'm not no it's it's a shared responsibility but it kind of i think it was born in your head more than in mine yeah i like to play it safe me or she's <laughs> the one who like makes the bold decisions That's and it. i'm like okay I'll, I'll go with it uh but i felt like that was i know feeling is not what you should be building your business idea on but it's a part of it yeah. i think as well and when you look around there are not many places where you can actually get that experience. Whereas where we from, we're both from Poland. I think I can say that now. Uh, cryotherapy is um, is very common. When you're uh-huh. injured, actually, the first thing that is prescribed is and either swimming, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. from your yeah. you know <laughs> GP first contact, or cryotherapy. So it's kind of we were brought up um, in Poland and that was surrounded by cryotherapy and the common knowledge of the fact that cryotherapy brings inflammation down. Um, speed up recovery and then you get an, an amount of other benefits that comes with it as well but mainly as a recovery tool and kind of speeding up uh, you know the process that leads you from you know when you get injured to the point where you can actually move cryotherapy was always a part of that rehabilitation process as for playing it safe and having the risk take i think you, got, you guys have struck the balance pretty well <laughs> I think yeah, every every good business is one of each. Yeah, I hope yeah. So. no, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And I, I think the, there's also a, a little bit more of a story in terms of how we got there to, to start with. Um, and the, the idea wasn't just born as we opened in pandemic. You kind of think of another idea that came in pandemic, but uh, the idea has been there since I think uh, 2012. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned your family uh, big rugby supporters um so i went to a conference uh uk strength and conditioning uh, association conference back in 2012 and the keynote speaker was the director of rugby at the time um for welsh national team 
and they did relatively well. Um, this was the World Cup in New Zealand, I believe. Um, and they came to semi-final, and I, th I think they lost uh, to Kiwis, who then uh, became world champions. However, the the the, the preparation was quite uh, interesting, and on the keynote speaker, basically showing us a, a, a pictures and videos of um, the team being in Poland in the high performance center in Spala. And yeah. they um, they use cryotherapy and they manage to get the typical hamstring grade two strain to uh, from like 21 days to 14, if I remember well. And for them, this was revolutionary. Um, they, they said they always go there for six weeks before the major tournament. And at the end of the slides, they shown us the pictures of one build at the Millennium Stadium at the time or mm -hmm. called Principality now. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it and he finished the slides going, basically we're let, we're waiting for the polls to teach us how to use it. And at that point I looked around, there's about three hundred people, no one knew what whole body cryotherapy was. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how do they not know? Mm -hmm. Um and I think that that is where the idea was born that there wasn't one here at a time. So how does whole body cryotherapy work? So um, there are two chambers. We put the patient or client or whoever is volunteering and willing to freeze themselves uh, to a pre-chamber. So the temperature goes to minus 60 Celsius. You stay there for 30 seconds, so your body acclimatizes to the temperature. And then you enter a main chamber where the temperature drops to minus 120 Celsius. Uh, you stay there for three minutes. You can also leave at any stage. I think that's very important to say. Physiologically, <laughs> that's good. physiologically, what happens is that we rely on flight and fight response. So blood goes back essentially to the heart to protect internal organs. So that's vasodilation, vasoconstriction. So you're kind of relying on that. And then when you come out, you get redistribution of blood. So you get more nutrients in, oxygen in, and the pain threshold shifts as well. You get more endorphins as well. So the, the, the result lasts for up to 24 hours. So you should get a great night's sleep after that as well. But essentially, we rely on that blood coming centrally to the heart and then redistribution of it as well. Um, so the idea is that uh, for the next 24 hours, the inflammation should go down. Sleeping should be much better. You get more oxygen through, through the muscles as well. If you do it on a regular basis, meaning the research says twice a week, that's a gold standard, the exposure of three minutes, 30 seconds, twice a week, that should be the most optimal. Mm -hmm. However, we see with our patients and athletes that it works slightly differently for every person. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what it is, really. Awesome. It's very pleasant. It's not as bad, actually, yeah. when you're inside. Yeah, you guys need to try it. <laughs> it it's, it's the nature of the dry cold. So yeah. the gold standard uh, whole body cryotherapy chambers, they uh, they use liquid nitrogen, which is vaporized, um, so it's safe to go in. Mm -hmm. uh, and also there is a, a, a gas, uh, as in there's oxygen uh, ambient oxygen level in the chamber, so you can breathe. But we do advise to keep the masks on uh, during treatment. But that's a gold standard sort of form of uh, using it, and it's different to wet cold. Mm -hmm. So if you go to an ice bath or have a cold or cold shower, your initial reaction is worse than it is when you go into the mm -hmm. cryo chamber. Yes, it does get worse with time. Obviously, longer you stay, cooler your body gets, and you start to notice periphery. So the distal sort of Listen, um, digits or, or your toes or fingers and, and you, you may start feel, uh, to feel a bit of a pins and needles or, um, uh, small sensations. But because it's dry cold, there's no like risk of frostbite if you overstay and things like that. But still, obviously we wear protective clothing. So we make sure that the areas that should be covered are covered. So you wearing long socks to encourage circulation, shorts, mm -hmm. sports bra, uh, with no wires. Gloves, um, mask, as Miwash mentioned, and also a hat. If there is any metal, then we cover it or we take it out. Um, because still there is a risk. Obviously, it's minimized, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure that we're wearing the protective clothing. And you get beautiful slippers as well. Everyone says they want to take them home. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's so we, we, we did, we, we sort of make sure that the safety component is as a priority, uh, when our patients come. And certainly when we have some of the professional footballers come in here or the rugby players that have done cryotherapy before, they say that we are very much more strict than anywhere else that w they went. And for that, mainly because we, we have that, obligation in the UK, um, going to Poland, Germany, this is a medical device. However, in the UK, it isn't, and it's not regulated by a medical council, by all means. Therefore, we need to make sure that everything is safe and we don't get any uh, side effects mm -hmm. of, of that treatment. So we have a thorough health questionnaire when people come in, and then is by our choice, since cardiovascular disease may be a, 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 a red flag when, when doing, obviously, stress exposure, um, we do check blood pressure before they come in. And any history of cardiovascular disease, we, we advise not to do it or at least speak to their cardiologist or consultant that uh, is treating them if that's a safe uh, modality for them to use yeah sounds like you guys have got the safety and everything like properly under control so there's no no trouble here i was going to say you work with um football players and rugby players what are some of the benefits of cryotherapy that rowers could possibly take advantage of in in this sport i, I think just going back to uh why we've chosen cryotherapy here and, and at the stage where we've decided to, to purchase one unit um, the, the company that uh, they've approached to fit it up for us um, supplied basically 70% of Premier League clubs in the UK. And generally speaking, Premier League, Championship, uh, almost all, and some of the League One in professional football uh, in the UK has cryotherapy. And it's used practically for obviously high budget uh, allowing clubs um every day in nfl there is a there are studies done on nfl players that clubs basically perform the cryotherapy before and during a break um to um to help the athletes with pain reception and etc however uh the reason uh why we think it's it it, it, it is useful in for the athletic population and rowers and what why is it you know why could it work for for this specific type of athlete i think the what i mentioned earlier on what i like about rowers is the amount of volume that you guys do all of your injuries or let's say in high 70 percent of the injuries are overuse injuries that means the muscle or the collagen that's been damaged mm -hmm. isn't recovering and or needs an aid of recovery uh, it, it's not recovering by all means it's not forming in new layers and over time shortens and we develop uh, things like tendinopathies mm -hmm. um normally as you know yourselves that if there is an injury it doesn't it's not like an acute injury and it goes away after you rest for three days mm -hmm. unless you change something about it and 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 work it through it doesn't go away very quickly. So for me and my athletes, it, it, it's super important to get the top three requirements for recovery. And that is sleep, nutrition, and hydration. Mm -hmm. And I've done similar review for the rugby club before I even joined a, a rowing club. Um, they've asked me basically to give them a talk and research the scientific evidence behind using skins as recovery leggings mm -hmm. and and this whether it's a it's it's worth a while investment and so i did the research and consensus was in at the time this was back in 2012 let's say or 11 um the consensus was that unless you hit the big three that i've mentioned earlier on that's 85% of your recovery. A leggings overnight may give you some small percentage. Hot, cold water may give you some small percentage. Mm -hmm. um, cryotherapy 
you know, may give you some small percentage. But for me, the cryo helps to sleep. And in order for the protein to fix itself and repair, you need to be somehow paralyzed. And that is obviously during your sleep yeah. and REM and, di and deep sleep, you know? Yeah, I really liked um, when, I can't remember who said it, but um, thinking of training is you're not building muscle in the gym. No. You're tearing your muscle down in the gym. Correct. You're building at home, at sleep, Correct. when you're resting. Correct. So you need to take that bit as seriously as, as the work in the gym. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, especially in our environment, when you have a number, well, they're all young student athletes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't, I think we all are guilty of that. We don't take rest for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and when I speak to my athletes, first years or second years of trialing, normally when they hear 10 hour that you require to recover in terms of sleep, uh, if you an athlete of more than 20 hours, they will look at me go like, what's wrong with you? There's like, there's no chance I'm getting a 10 hour sleep. Yeah. No chance. Especially with, you know, if you wake up at five to go to your training at 5.30, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so, so it, it's a problem in itself. Um, I think, um, and, and, and nutrition is the other factor, you know, but, uh, but cryotherapy for me, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys covered this before, but, uh, for me, it affects the heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So it has an impact on my, on the autonomic nervous system. And as a result, that allows me to have a longer sleep. Um, and there are studies to back that, mm -hmm. um, and less movement during sleep, meaning that it is more likely I'm getting deep sleep or quality sleep that allows my body to recover. Yeah. So you, your body's fully taken advantage of the rest that it, it does have to, to yeah. fully maximize the, the potential of, of, of the recovery. Just to, just to touch on the heart, heart rate variability. We recently, I think on the Dave Bell episode, we spoke about, how um, there was an athlete who's completed a marathon at a pace of sub 640 per every 2K for the whole 42K. And uh, one of the ways that he was able to achieve that was by accurately tracking his heart rate variability and like how his body like, was responding to that. So it is something that could like definitely benefit Rose greatly. I think uh, all you need to know about those numbers, Pete just said, is that they're insane. Uh, I think it was more about the, the heart rate uh, variability during training in the yeah. way that he trained for it, not necessarily like during during the event. But yeah, that's that's just something that again that seems to be coming up more. Yeah, it was yeah. like adjusting intensity and like you know knowing when to increase or decrease training load and like his UT two splits and then little things sure. like and, that. And yeah, I there is uh, the the research. I mean, the heart rate variability research is much more. Um, and evolved since I studied sports science. Um, however, um, in professional or high performance or Premier League, and let's say, um, sporting environment, what we normally use is a creatine kinase as a predictor of the damage of the muscle fiber. Um, it's an enzyme released as a result of damage to the muscle. And that is used in saliva or urine tests, and obviously blood tests also can show that. Uh, but I think you, since the uh, use of um, heart rate variability, it made it easier and more available to anyone really mm -hmm. um, to monitor their, their recovery and how fresh they are expecting to be based on that heart rate variability. Obviously, you can change um, based on whether you are going through a systemic illness, be it infection. Um, so, that, but it's good to know that uh, you're not you're not hitting great numbers with regards to recovery. Um, therefore, your training may be affected. Obviously, you always have to take all the data that you're receiving off your watch or wrist yeah. um, it, 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 with a pinch of salt. I, I think no. Uh, 
big program, let's say you know uh, a Yale rowing program, or uh, will uh, will will allow athletes to basically ch- pick and choose which days to train, mm-hmm. uh, or say oh, I'm not doing the six k today because uh, because my heart rate variability is off. Yeah. Um, so the, the, it's a sort of I think just as probably Gosha spoken to you about um, female athletes and adaptation to training, I think it's a it, we'll, we'll have to. A learn as we go and adapt the program to it yeah but there's definitely not a case of uh just manning up sometimes because you're not pulling your heart splits like there's a scientific reason why absolutely. like there's absolutely. something to link with recovery absolutely yeah i am um, i also want to ask there's loads of stuff you see online now about ice baths and all these different companies that give you ice baths and everyone talking about how amazing they are uh what's sort of the difference between like an ice bath and cryotherapy um First of all, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the unpleasantness of uh, of an ice bath is a bit more pronounced uh, than when when you first go in. Oh, when it's a big barrier in. to entry. Yeah, it's um, tough. Second thing, with regards to comparison or direct comparison, um, in order so when we allow our athletes to go in to the chamber just before we test the lower limb temperature and um and when they come out we'll test it again and see by how much the the, the surface skin temperature dropped now in order to numb the pain or numb the what we know as a nociceptor the pain receptor on the skin, that these are the studies done on the ice packs on the side of the pitch. You know why mm. do people, why do athletes get receive one of those mm. to reduce swelling, etc. Uh, they found that you need to s- drop the skin temperature anywhere below fifteen degrees Celsius. So anywhere between ten and fifteen is what you want to achieve. Now, of that, the com- there was a comparison studies uh, where they looked at so how long would it take to do the same thing that the cryotherapy can achieve in three minutes because below 15 degree it is quite an easy one to do in mm-hmm. three minutes. Um, how long would it take in the ice bath? Mm. And the rough uh, estimate is 11 to 15 minutes. <laughs> no one's doing that. I'm not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, are people really doing those ice bath for 15 minutes <laughs> oh, no. every day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and then the second thing was it would be the hormonal aspect. Yeah. So if we're looking at uh, affecting autonomic nervous systems such as vagus nerve, your head needs to be part of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, trust me, an ice bath with a head in yeah. for 15 minutes. Uh, uh, yeah, good point. No one's putting that. I mean, exactly. I've, I've once, um, when I came back from a Christmas break, I, it was the, the boiler turned off in my house and then there was no hot water and the water was so cold. I'm sure it was still above zero. Yeah. But like I had such a bad f- brain freeze when I tried to take a shower. I can't imagine doing that in an ice bath, yeah. let alone for 15 minutes. Yeah, for sure. For right. sure. So the other thing with ice baths, so we used to do them, um, especially when we went on altitude training camp, pretty heavy program. There was um, up, a, up in that center, there was a place where you could put, ice in big bins and okay. get in that yep. um so we used to mostly do it because we found it hilarious and trying to deal with the cold was awful and it became this sort of macho thing but um we actually the physiologist actually came and spoke to us and said um what you don't realize about still doing all these ice baths is that you're actually like reducing your adaptation to training because you're taking the inflammation away and your body's not forced to adapt so that he had said to us that you should try and only use it if you really feel like you need to. Yeah. Um, and I watched a video again recently about a guy basically saying the same thing, that what happens if you're going in the ice bath every single day, your body just gets more and more used to using the ice bath as a as a mechanism yeah. and gets worse at adapting itself. Yeah, is that Is that kind of thing... Does that make sense based on what you know? And is that no, the same I, for, for, for sure? I mean, bear in mind my training is osteopathy, so everything w- w- I was trained on t- is to be as naturopathic as you can be. Um, and the, in, in therapeutic aspect, um, we were simply told put put cold on uh, hot and acute, uh, yeah. and, and the benefits for that in in acute injuries is obviously to reduce the swelling. Um, and 
it, with, with what, what happens at the time is that the swelling obstructs the blood flow uh, and uh, with fresh nutrients to the injured area. Mm-hmm. So certainly you would do that then, uh, and hence it's not it's not. If you look at the the, the acute injury um, diagrams or recommendations or mnemonics, um, you've had rice since seventies, um, so raise eyes compression and until a peace and love now, uh, which also still includes eyes in it uh, for an acute injury. So we have enough and, and excludes in anti-inflammatories. Mm-hmm. This is the probably thing that your physiologist was trying to suggest. That recently we found that, um, and, and I believe this was a, a study on general population, is that if you take anti-inflammatories in acute stage of an injury, you're more likely to develop chronic pain. Okay. Um, so, it is, and it's more, it was probably more to do with the modulation of pain rather than, um, messing around with the inflammatory response. But I take this for granted. Uh, it, for chronic uh, patients, we uh, recommend warm uh, in order to increase the circulation mm-hmm. because you're less likely have enough blood flow to the chronically injured area. Mm-hmm. Um, but in sports performance, and when I graduated, I've constantly heard from my athletes that I've been rec- I was recommended by my physio to do hot. And what I and then over time I would ask my athletes what helps you with the with the muscle ache. Mm-hmm. And on and off they would say that hot bath in the evening is the key. Mm-hmm. And be it then there's some evidence suggesting that the warm uh, desensitizes the muscle and it can relax. Certainly, Bath does that for many people, whether they are athletes or not. Um, I think, um, it, it, as a result, um, you could say that cryotherapy will modulate the receptors. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, you, you kind of need to go and see what's more important. If it affects my sleep, I'll do that to then recover my muscles and reduce the swelling. Mm -hmm. And the cold will reduce the swelling because it will increase that circulation. Inflammatory response, absolutely. But in that case, why do you train twice a day? as a rower. Why do you train three times a day? Mm-hmm. If we allow in the body to respond to inflammatory naturally, why aren't we giving athletes at least 24 hour break from an endurance type of training? Uh-huh. And equally, fast twitch fiber damage such as uh, resistant training should be about 36 hours minimum mm-hmm. because your collagen drops down to uh, low levels at peak at 20 hours and it stays around that level to about 36 hours but no next day you wake up and you go for an endurance event so i think you need to look at it from different perspective Mm -hmm. you're doing something that your body's not supposed to do anyway yeah right is it is it do you think is to build the because obviously rowing is a power endurance sport so you you, you have to be building is it to basically build endurance in your opinion, what would you mean? The training two or three times a day. Uh, well, I, I always, I think it's a good question for any physiologists. Um, I, I think you know, you, you as rowers, you would say you need to build the engine, right? So you need to have the cardiorespiratory adaptation uh, in order then to uh, convert that to a more fast switch or uh, a faster um, type of. Um, contraction and i think um it's it 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 is certainly a question from physiology point of view why do you need to grind so many hours to make that 2k event which we know it's uh, in the completely different levels of physiology than what you do when you do your t2 right Mm -hmm. um so uh 
put it that way. I, I think when I first started as an SNC coach in Rowan, I knew there was a good contribution of a type two fiber um, when we contract the muscle in Rowan event. Um, not only that, um, if you got the mass mm -hmm. and you don't have the strength, then you're not going to move that boat as fast as you could, which is a, a simple uh, equation, force yeah. equals mass times acceleration. You know. And I think that was the argument I, I, uh, I gave uh, Rob when I first um, joined the CUW BC at the time, um, is that, well, we, we've got heavy enough athletes, but we don't, you know, we, we've got to produce more force. And how do we do it? We've got the mass, mm -hmm. but we haven't got the acceleration. Um, and I thought that that can only be done with uh, controlled, resisted exercises uh, with the load to work against um, rather than time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the other thing I, that's really interesting, and I think, yeah, I mean, I have heard other athletes talk about um, realizing this, uh, reducing the amount of training they do and seeing a performance benefit. Um, so I think like it's, it's interesting to talk about. But then also the aspect of, yeah, when we're talking about high-performance athletes, someone who's training three times a day, then like the, the idea of having the ability to, to like cryo cryotherapy, the ability to sort of speed up those kind of things is mm -hmm. is uh, super important and like you said with rowing it's um a lot of these injuries are very it's repetitive strain stuff like okay. it's always funny how you'll see in general if it's just a sort of general training block 90 percent of your athletes are there but when it comes to like oh it's a it's a trial day yeah. and only 50 percent now hang on what what happened to everyone overnight it, cool. it wasn't that it happened overnight it's they're all carrying something that they feel that they can train with but when it comes yeah. to like having to put performance in yeah. So, like in our sport, that that kind of thing is something like you need to really think about as well. Yeah, and I think uh, when I every season I start with a new group of athletes, and probably we get sixty to seventy percent, depends on the year, of um, of new athletes coming through every year. Um, not only as a challenge to learn all the names quickly, but uh, <laughs> but but certainly. Um, what I want to and um, what we work with Gosha on is that we want to let everyone know that any niggle, flag it. Uh, because I think even as a junior rower, you just learn to get on with it mm. and then hopefully you will pass on. And it, and it does because you've got a young, healthy body and whatnot. And then some of you may have had a, a week or two off and then went away, mm. right? That's no problem. But especially when it comes to rib injuries and I'm sure you you you, you both um, from this world and you know exactly uh, how um, dormant it can be mm -hmm. um, to, to have a rib pathology and um, if you feel a bit of an ache not anything you know a bit of a stitch when breathing flag it and I think what we've done very well um, since um, since we've sort of taken over a little bit on the on the on the uh, CUBC men's side, is that um, we offload as soon as possible, and we offload for short periods of time. And so, let's say I have a I have an athlete with seven out of ten likely stress reaction to the rib. Mm -hmm. I offload that athlete for a week and then build up training back up for the next following two weeks normally that's enough for the collagen and the bone to resurface and give them no symptoms rather than your typical six to eight weeks out mm. because that's how you treat the, yeah. you know, the normal stress reaction you would go and see a non-rowing specific um, MSK consultant or practitioner such as osteopath physio sports mm -hmm. therapist um you will be recommended to offload for six to eight weeks uh, and you know how much this is going to impact you a trialist yeah, i mean this is pretty impossible in a program like um cambridge where you've got such a short season and like six to eight weeks is you know Absolutely. but it's like what is 
a fifth of the season, essentially. Absolutely. And I think we've got the same culture with the coaches. The coaches understand the same thing. Um, and they've worked in Rowan for so many years, many more years than I have. And they understand when the rip is on the, on the show, we take action straight away. And, and, and we try to educate our athletes that way from the start. Um, and, you know, it, it, back in the old research, in terms of rowing pathologies, you see a, a, a Harvard study where the number when one injury was a knee. And it's like, hold on a second. I'm looking at this data, going like, I've been probably working with rowers at the time five years, and I've, I see like knee maybe once or twice a year. Uh, yeah, back of the knee, fine. The hamstring attachment yeah, point yeah. is maybe that's what they meant. But, um, but it's like knee number one injury in rowing. And obviously third came like ro- um, uh, wrist injuries were number two. And then three was, was like, that's in Harvard. Wow. <laughs> right. So, so, but this is, this, this was, and I think they've looked at ta- a thousand instant, uh, like a, a data of a thousand injuries. Wow. Um, but, um, but let, let, let's be honest, the, the, the realistic uh, number is that the number one injury is lower back pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two being rib stress reactions or rib pathologies. But in terms of time loss to training, rib is number one yeah. uh, injury in, in rowing. Yeah, I think you're right. It's um, it's getting the idea into the athlete's head that it, it's one week now or eight weeks later. Correct. Um, and I think that's been difficult. Um, you know, like we've talked before about dealing with athletes who will hide pain. Yeah. Um, we talked to Alex Partridge who who rode um, with a punctured lung. Yeah. Because his rib stress fracture had gone and punctured his lung. Yeah. was continuing to row and train with it and hide in the corner and not tell anyone. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's a culture that, that hopefully – is changing. I've seen it changing. I mean, certainly, I, I started rowing in uh, 2002, something like 2003, and it probably w- was it wasn't till about 2015 that I even heard the term prehab, mm-hmm. or that we would even try and be trying to fix problems before we get there. Obviously, like things like core circuits and stuff like that's kind of prehab, but it wasn't named that. Mm-hmm. And there certainly wasn't any any thoughts of like trying to get ahead of problems. Yeah. But that's certainly changed. I, I think, and I think, you know, you, one of your questions earlier was how, how do I find it? Why did I end up with Rowan? And, um, and but just having a, a strength and a conditioning background uh, allows you to look for these perfect alignments in biomechanics. Mm. And we know that rowing isn't uh, a perfect biomechanical posture when it comes to a catch position for a sculler, mm-hmm. right? Um, and uh, you, you you could you can fall into this trap where, as a novice SNC coach, if you come into a rowing population, you'd be uh, making them too tense and too upright. Mm. Um, but um, but one of the things, so when I maybe year in. Um, when when I joined in to the women's squad, we had quite a number of rib stress fractures, quite a lot, in fact. And the typical, at the time, SNC program, um, which was also supplied some of the program to uh, from the uh, EIS and then mm. uh, the Bishop, Bishop uh, and, and Cavisham was that uh, the athletes just concentrate on the deadlift um, bench pull um, and um, uh, a, 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 and potentially a squat, you know? Um, these are the key, you know, uh, maybe some hip cleans or power cleans, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and and that would probably be not too d- dissimilar to your training if yeah. you were there. And, um, but, but there was... So, so my thing at the time was, why don't we teach them to press vertically and as i what, what do you mean like you want athletes to do overhead squats or do you want you know what and i've put in the program uh, jerks um overhead squats overhead lunges mm-hmm. um and in fact actually i gave one presentation back in 2017 
which had a collaboration of videos and used an image in Grant as a case study. And she was doing cleans, overhead squats, and uh, snatches um, in that yeah. uh, collaboration, only to become an under twenty three champion a uh, month later. Um, so, it, 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 in and I was showing that this way we could stabilize the scapula and posture better than doing push pull exercises or trying to balance out. Because the, the talk at the time was predominantly balance out the scapula, you'll be fine. Yeah. Because, you know, they pull all the time. So why don't we do b bench presses and press ups? Yeah. And for women, obviously, it's harder because of the muscle mass in the upper body mm -hmm. to initially get one or two press ups, um, especially if you've got a nervous SNC yeah. athlete. So instead, I mean, obviously, we did lots of press ups and lots of bench presses and a lot of stability of the scapula, but we've invested a lot of time um, to to do a, a shoulder stability, vertical shoulder stability, because that will, you know, you you can't have posture like this. The bar will yeah. drop forward, and be it, it happened many times, and um, no one got injured, which is fine. But, yeah, but uh, but that within the year reduced. Rib stress fractures by forty percent, and that is by just altering strength and conditioning program, not the physical therapy approach, mm. not the volume intensity uh, of the training adaptations. Simply working at the exercises that you wouldn't necessarily think that they are rowing specific. Yeah, I think a lot of coaches would avoid doing like those sorts of lifts purely due to the risk of like, what if an athlete gets injured during a jerk, etc. Like, I've personally like never done power cleans on like those sorts of like ver vertical movements as an athlete, but that's just so like interesting. Like, I've never ever heard anyone else talk yeah. about this. Before. Yeah, I, I think it, it. I think it's a it's a hard period for any. Um, any staff such as strength and conditioning mm -hmm. to convince a, uh, a given sport coach that it's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, I'm, I'm lucky that I've developed a, a decent enough relationship with, with, with the head coach and uh, he trusts me when I make, uh, we make those decisions. Um, and if you know you're in trouble and you always done it that same way, why, why wouldn't you try something different mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and even coaches get absolutely they, they reflect on each program right they keep changing things every year they, they you don't probably know one coach that will always do the same thing no they, they yeah. may have the same values and principles but they will change it ad, adapt to reflect on and i think uh, that was the opportunity at which we we've started to change things for women and uh, and bear in mind, we were losing quite a lot. Um, I think um, the, the Cambridge women haven't, you know, ever since they started winning, mm -hmm. and how uh, likely we've been part of that. Um, they haven't lost uh, their boat races, and that's great to see. But we we were trying to figure out how to win against Oxford. Pace know? to take a risk. Yeah, yeah, you need to. Yeah, if you're not changing things, you're not trying. I think the the key is to change one thing at a time. And then yeah. you can actually measure the the difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. You talking like we we discussed actually. Someone asked um, us whether whether they should consider adding Olympic lifts to their program. My response at the time was, uh, I think the reason why you don't see things like clean and jerk and snatch um, is because there's a higher injury risk. But that's in terms of trying to put a maximum weight on the bar. You know, we also discussed that um, we've all been we've all been in the weight room and forgot the actual reason we're there and actually just started trying to beat everyone else around us. Yeah. So yeah. in terms of adding those lift in, as long as everyone knows, understands the point of this is to, is to, is for, um, scapular strength. We're not here to maximize our, our clean and jerk. I think that's a really interesting thing to use that in a way to actually, like you said, you didn't get any injuries. I'm assuming you weren't smash, you know, trying to put the, you can, you can take the ego out of the room and just say, this is the reason why we're doing this. I think obviously, like it's really interesting. I, to see I the think you, you you need a good coach in yeah. the room, um, 
uh, that will stop any all of that. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, it, it, it takes uh, time to learn the Olympic derivative. Um, and in fact, my boss, when I first joined in uh, the CU WBC at the time, um, would would say exactly that. Um, I see the benefits of doing um, of doing Olympic derivatives and why you would like to do it. However, there is not much time to teach these athletes, and we only see them twice a week. Mm. Um, so let's just stay and, and and carry on with the things we know they will be able to do, and uh, and we can adjust, coach them, and make them perform that better. And um, and and in in reality. What I found over time is that actually they've never done this movement before and they learn quicker than I have myself to do Olympic derivatives enough to pass mm -hmm. my accreditations. Mm -hmm. It took me ages to master it. But then I know what how I went through it and how hard it was. I know what to spot, gave them quick coaching cues and then they were all lifting properly within a month or so yeah that's the benefit of if you don't having... practice you don't see it progressing right yeah absolutely i think that's the benefit of like having someone who's done it before gone through like all the trials and tribulations and can immediately give you like a a fast roadmap to to getting yeah. that thing right i was going to ask as someone who's obviously working on fixing broken athletes and prehab is definitely something that i imagine you have in mind what are some of the best ways to protect like back injuries is, is so protect rowers from like acquiring back injuries. Yeah, um, I, I think we've been lucky uh, to say that majority, if not all, our injuries are related to either a muscle uh, uh, ache, um, you would call it a, a strain, um, or to do with the arrangement of the way the sacroiliac joint moves. Mm -hmm. um, so less likely we are experiencing disc pathologies, but they can they can occur, um, and obviously they are um, they're taking longer in recovery. So, um, but I think males specifically, based on what I uh, I've seen in my practice um, and all the athletes I worked with, um, I think. Um, there are some contributing factors. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, um, it, the hip flexibility is probably one of the most important factors. Yeah. Um, hence, at the beginning of the season, we test the mobility or flexibility, if you like, in terms of the muscle. Um, but is the athlete able to actually get to the front end without um, compensating in the spine? Hmm. Uh, or overusing the erector spinal muscles. Uh, and, and unfortunately, when the pain does arise and it, it becomes a chronic, then there are actual changes within the spine, such as, you know, one of the stabilizing muscles of multifidi becomes atrophied, and then the erector spinal muscles becomes even, become even more tonic or hypertonic. Hmm. And that can stimulate pain itself without the actual injury in the structure of the spinal column um and so the, the we we kind of almost when the when the rower comes into the clinic a you rule out as a disc pathology uh make sure there's no neurological symptoms mm -hmm. but number two uh you look at the predisposing factors and that can be a a leg length discrepancy now 90 percent of us have leg length discrepancy so that, that doesn't mean anything, but I call it a predisposing factor. One tick, hypermobility, two ticks, um, hip mobility, ankle mobility, um, the hamstring, the, the knee extension, mm -hmm. uh, ability to rock over, uh, all that matters. And, um, you know, in, in the case of hip flexors, for example, got, if someone's got tight hip flexors, the pelvis is more likely to rotate anteriorly so forward mm -hmm. too early in the rock over so as a result as you slide to the front end 
you may not have the space. It's almost like squatting with overarched to lower back. Yeah. You don't have space. So what you do do is you tuck under mm. the tailbone and then round your lumbar spine and take more load in your spine than you should um, normally. And it, it, the perception is, or, oh, you've got tight hamstrings because your bum is tucking under. Mm-hmm. But no, you've rolled the pelvis because your deep hip flexors are overactive um, or you initiate the movement from overarching your lower back and yeah. the rock over. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes, I've just literally gone through like imagining in my head that yeah. that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think and, also, and we squat like that as well. Uh, yeah. And then you can see it in the gym. You, you can literally diagnose the rower by squatting. And it was one of the things I asked them to do with before they lie down on the couch. Can you squat for me? And then you see it and then you go like, do you know what? I see this happening. I'm going to quickly run the Thomas test on the, on the hip flexor. Uh, and that confirms that there's just that. That list that you that you put of like different leg length and then um, a bunch of other factors, I think I get like a cross on pretty much all of them. So. Oh, but we are. I've got yeah. a hip socket difference. I've got a leg length difference. I've got um, spine curvature. I've got a super long back. Yeah. I've got all the problems. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And then that, these are all predisposing yeah. factors. They yeah. are not the reason why you may have an injury. They may lead you to an injury. But the key factor to any body uh, will be the, the the body's ability to recover in such a volume-related mm-hmm. sport. Mm. And if you don't have that, then you start to break down a bit more when you have a you know convex, slightly scoliotic spine to left side. Obviously, your left uh, paraspinal muscles will be a bit shorter on that side, therefore more prone if they uh, they haven't recovered to break down mm. uh, and lead to pain or discomfort or whatever you like to call it. I'm fascinated by like how simply you just put and explain back injuries. Like uh, I've never, I've never really like heard anyone like put it in in those terms, but it makes perfect sense. Also, like I'm not sure people and rowers will be like aware of like those their own pretty predispositions when like choosing which side to row and stuff. Because for example, if they have shorter muscles on one side, that could possibly lead to a faster risk of injury. And yeah. they'll, they'll be fine on the other side, but they might say, oh, I just prefer that one because I'm left or right-handed or, or things like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, there are... Um, I think it's almost like with leg lengths. You, um, you may not know you have a minor scoliosis one side or the other, and um, uh, hence when we screen the athletes early in early season we look at those differences between left and right mm-hmm. and if i have a stroke cider that can uh that can barely turn to the right and uh, and have, has more thoracic rotation to the left uh, i will investigate why mm-hmm. if that's a functional scoliosis okay well that, we need to do something about this but if it's a structural scoliosis and we'll be like okay let's look at the uh, possibility of you giving it a go on the other side and see how it feels for you. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean they can just lay off the work on the stroke side. They, we still work on balance between left and right as much as we can, but we know there's a structural limitation in terms of how much rotation they can achieve. Uh, they may be six foot five and may not need that much of rotation. Mm. But you also know that if they don't and they're required to go long and strong, as we say in the UK, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they will need to lean into it to get there and compensate by the flex in the spine and side bending towards mm. the rigor, which creates problems in itself. It will compress the ribs when you breathe in and actually may lead to a stress reaction. As we know, for the sweep rowers, it's more likely to occur on the inside than the outside. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think kind of what you're Obviously. talking about is that everything's more interconnected than we when we'd like to know. We used to have a physio. We sort of almost make a joke that whatever, whatever the area of pain was that you went to see him for was never the area that he would work on. He yeah. would always go and see, I've got a bad back. Yep. You'd scapulate your glutes and like, yeah, I feel so much better now. You know, there yep. were so many other things. I remember one time when he was scapulating like 
uh, like almost inside like diaphragm and like yeah. um, uh, you know abdominals and things like that really interesting just to kind of learn about how connected stuff was um, and I was just thinking if it's a generalized question obviously but in terms of like the deficiencies that you see in mm-hmm. rowers is mm-hmm. are there any common themes that you can say this is something that's really common this is something that I would say to people or that you know things that you do like that yeah Good question. Uh, yeah I, I i have to say i'm not a biggest fan of specific core training yeah however um we when we test at the start of the season what we tend to do and see is that people struggle especially males on and actually no that's that's a lie i, I think it, females equally um is that uh, in an ability, and you guys can tell me if you've done this test before, but uh, an ability to hold long in supine position. So imagine you are held down by a person uh, in terms of your legs and your trunk is off the bench and you have to hold that trunk horizontally level. And... And then basically, we, we do that test every year. We do sides and 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 prone, which is looking down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe GB Rowan has had the same standards mm-hmm. in terms of trunk endurance testing. Now, what we tend to see, those that have tighter hip flexors or history of back pain would not do well. Mm. And, and uh, put it that way. In order to not do well on this test, you do need to turn the pelvis forward. If you got strong, deep abdominal contraction, i.e. the abdominal brace, uh, and you use your back muscles less, then it will lead to less injuries. Mm -hmm. Meaning that equally, I think Fiona Wilson was researching this back in Ireland, um, is that... If the athletes focus on anterior pelvic tilt at the catch, mm-hmm. specifically male athletes, um, and use core to drive rather than extensors uh, of the spine, so you're using your abdomen pressure, then it doesn't matter if you got a bit of a flexion in the spine. Because that's not where the load's going. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what you've just basically described to 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 us is that core tra- the 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 function and correct me please correct me if I'm wrong but the function of core training is to strengthen your pelvis to the point where it doesn't rot- rotate forward and also use the strengthen the hip flexor so that your spine basically doesn't get at risk and like essentially most of the back problems in rowing would come from just the incorrect function of the pelvis in in a way. I think, A, you need to identify whether your hip flexors are short. And if you tell me that you have been stretching all your life but it hasn't helped, then you strengthen it. Mm-hmm. Um, I act, You almost think about it as a, oh, I will condition that, that muscle so it doesn't overreact and shorten. Yeah. Um, two, um, you would encourage an athlete to use the intra-abdominal pressure i.e. bracing Mm -hmm. that comes from the deep think about it like a belt of a trunk and glute at the same time Mm -hmm. so you almost want to engage the the posterior and anterior together Mm -hmm. but not from the hip flexor and the lower back so you can have almost the two opposite if you think about a cross across a side view of me yeah and you have that cross in the center of my hip uh you don't want to do that you want to do a a little bit of a neutral position with a tension more to do with the glutes and the core engaged together and that will protect the spine in my opinion more um than the than really trying to strengthen your back muscles more if yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's not not it's not about the back extensions. It's not about um, bench pulls and bent over rows or um, or deadlifts. And uh, you know, Alex Wolf argued in his book uh, about not doing deadlifts at all in the rowing program. 
where we all know that rowers don't approach S and C or the gym without doing the deadlift. Mm -hmm. um, and equally, I could argue the same way why we do Olympic derivatives because it has a deadlift and a squat in it uh, and works at those angles anyway. And and I think if you ask me what's most beneficial as an exercise, the model of exercises is a squat. And I think squat performed well for a rowing athlete is a must. Wow. Yeah, I think wow. um, definitely the, the importance of um, glute strength has has risen to the front um so i say not recently so that's been something that i've noticed you know through my training you know especially again in the, in the british rowing team what alex wolf was my snc coach before yeah. he moved up yeah. um uh i think you know we're doing a lot of crab walks even specific um glute glute circuit sessions as opposed to core um i think my issue with with core I think it comes down to everything, but like it's understanding the reason why you're doing these movements. Again, yeah. it's taking the ego out. It's not who can plank longer than who who can plank the longest, yeah. and, it, and and it's so easy to just get into that bracing move, and yeah. you're not actually working in that in, interior belt, like you say. Yeah, yeah, and and, and it, you almost so the, the skill to it is almost creating a habit of abdominal contraction. Mm -hmm. We all can say we know how to when we are shown or practice, but we can't reproduce it for 2,000 reps that we have to do for in the next or more than that mm -hmm. uh, on the ERG. How can we reproduce it? How can we build such a body mechanic or habit that we do it every time we try? Over time, it will work, but um, and, and obviously if you practice. But if you don't practice... Uh, then you go, I mean, it's the same with rowing, guys. You, you've, you've, you've rowed some time and you learn all the time. And I don't think majority know exactly what that means, but even though they say they've been lifting 10 years or, you know, I've, and, and, and I really want to see these athletes when they, you know, there's some fr coming from states and will say, listen, I, Every time I did weights, I got injured and, and whatnot. I was like, then you haven't done weights um, because that, that's not how you do weights. Weights are not designed. It's, it's like people trying to correlate disc pathologies with deadlifting. Mm -hmm. um, but we also know no study correlated a deadlift with a disc pathology because there are so many more factors mm -hmm. involved uh, uh, for a given injury yeah. that we can't really clearly associated with it um now um being able to transfer the force from the legs to a trunk it's an essence to rowing performance mm -hmm. and if you can't do it then you will definitely learn how to do it in the gym and then from the gym you will aim to do that in the boat hopefully on the earth as well yeah, mm. saying every time I do weights I get injured is kind of like saying every time I put the keys in the ignition I crash. Well, you don't know how to drive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah, and again, you know, it comes down to just understanding the reason why you're in the gym as mm -hmm. opposed to just trying to hit the PB and ring the bell again. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, for some, it's it's the stature. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You get the advantage. Yeah, yeah, definitely, absolutely. Uh, I'm, this has been such a fascinating chat. I've learned, I've actually learned so much. It's given me like lots to, to think about. Also, like I still do quite a lot of training in the gym. Mm -hmm. So I will definitely like think about those things such as like pelvic rotation and stuff. Also, like trying out things like yoga and stuff has like really like made me like really think about those movements and, uh, in, in just ways that I haven't like really found useful before. Cause I'm someone who's always struggled with being chronically tight and under stretched yep. and stuff. Yep. So. It's given me lots to think about. I think it's also going to shine a lot of, it's going to turn a lot of lights on for, for a few rowers who, who will have listened to that. And I mean, at some point, I'd love to, to expand on that. And please, guys, if you have any questions about this sort of thing, do send them through and we'll make sure we'll prepare 
an, a, another action packed yeah, episode man. next time. I'll be looking forward to it for sure. Yeah, I'm thinking we could just we could go on forever, but um, here it's yeah. it's Valentine's Day, so we'll make sure we all have a chance That's to go okay. go home for dinner. I, I could have spent <laughs> many better guys. Literally. Thank you um, so much because honestly, your experience and knowledge and just just the way that you just put it so simply mm. is. Is mesmerizing. I think that's that's the that's one word that I can find. So thank you so so much. I appreciate. It. I think we all work much better if we. I mean, we all aim to simplify things in life, and I, and I think, um, I hope I can sort of show it to people that way, um, rather than thinking that they need to, you know, the, the number of people coming in and saying that they've always had a back pain, you know, um, and I think we just need to look at it from. A slightly different perspective. Uh, mm. Look at all the things that may be contributing to it, but also uh, understand that it, okay, it, it is a number one injury for Rowan, but it is easily prevent preventable. And uh, uh, and you can hopefully use strength uh, or strength specific programs and exercises um, to prevent an injury reoccurring. Yeah, yeah. I think it comes down to. Uh, you know, we talked about it a few times, but um, maximizing adaptation, which doesn't mean maximizing how much weight you're moving or or any exercise you come to. It's understanding like the end goal is to be better at the rowing movement and therefore you want to do it uh, better. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that doesn't need to be rowing specific. No. Um, and that's what... And that's I, not even sports specific. Yeah. That's life. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. One percent of the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I think that concludes everything for this episode. So on that note, easy there. Cue the music. <laughs> <laughs>